Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. As you are aware, this is fourth of a series of webinars on the Brahmaputra. The importance of the Brahmaputra needs no emphasis, whether politically, economically, or even from a strategic security perspective. The Brahmaputra is a very unique river and has to be understood on multiple fronts before any attempt is made to manage any aspect of the river. There are many researchers with a very high level of research uh, contributions who are involved. And we thought that it is important to have a broad spectrum that we try to cover. And today we have a very eminent panel with diverse expertise. Today is also a very important day being the National Maritime Day. This year's theme is sustainable shipping beyond COVID-19. I think it is it symbolizes two important aspects, namely India's commitment to the sustainable development goals and also the critical situation in terms of the economic downturn and loss of opportunities in our region and what the young India is going through today post the pandemic. So we'll get started. Our first speaker needs no introduction. Lieutenant General Viji Khandare, sir, PVSM, AVSM, SM. He is right now the advisor to the Honorable Raksha Mantri. And he was a former military advisor to the National Security Secretariat. A person who understands security from a geopolitical and the regional dynamics very, very well. Somebody who has served in the Northeast for a very long time. So he understands what the Brahmaputra is and what the strategic security imperatives are. He retired from active military service on 31st January 2018 and was the military, as I said, was a military advisor from 2018 to 2021. In his final active military appointment, he served as both the Director General of Defense Intelligence Agency and the Deputy Chief of Integrated Defense Staff for Intelligence. During his military service, he was involved in operational tasks in various sectors of Siachen, JNK, Sikkim, as well as the Northeast region. He has also served as instructor on weapons at Infantry School Mao and as directing staff at Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. He has received uh, many honors and decorations during his service in the Indian Army. General, sir, your close, sir. Uh, thank you, Arnav, and uh, Jai Hind to all the listeners and viewers. And my compliments to everyone on the National Maritime Day. Uh, I want to compliment the Maritime Research Center as well as the NDT for jointly hosting this initiative. And very interesting topic. Uh, when you look at Brahmaputra, it needs no emphasis, the kind of importance all rivers have because civilizations come up in uh, the river basins only. and uh, our entire northeastern region, uh, in a way, is dependent on most of the economic activities which are around the Brahmaputra basin. Brahmaputra, interestingly, being such a huge river, it is a lifeline for people in Assam as well as people in Bangladesh. It has its implications, the kind of water that is there in Bay of Bengal. Uh, the Geostrategic importance is highlighted by the fact that China has been extremely active in trying to carry out activities on to Brahmaputra River. What are the implications that India will have to face? So while I would focus on the geostrategic issues, but I again want to compliment Arnab for getting such a rich and diverse a gathering of such experts of eminence, whether it is from the historical perspective, whether it is from the economic perspective, the science domain, and most important, he's linked it up beautifully to the underwater domain awareness. And underwater domain awareness is what has been our focus, mostly into the Indian Ocean region. But I am very keen to understand from this discussion how it would impact our northeastern region, our economic factors, our environmental challenges. So I'm all ears for whatever is the outcome of this excellent webinar. My compliments to everyone. And let us proceed with this rich discussion. Jai Hind. Thank you so much, sir. It definitely gives us a good start. And 
uh, we definitely would like to contribute in a manner that it can help people like you at the decision making level i would now like to make a small presentation on the underwater domain awareness framework so that we are able to set the tone for today's webinar looking at the underwater domain awareness uh, today's topic is cop26 and the brahmaputra as uh, general sir said uh, the underwater domain is not just in the oceans or the sea but a large part of it is also very much relevant in the freshwater systems and brahmaputra is a very very important example so today i'll try and cover some of the geo strategic context india in the 21st century what this uda is all about some of our mrc efforts and what could be some of the way ahead now in the 21st century we can very well see that large part of the maritime interaction or even the strategic interactions are happening in the tropical waters and the tropical waters bring a very very unique aspect in terms of political economic military and even from a technology perspective just to give you a very simple example a sonar that is used to see anything below water irrespective of what the application is whether it is military or blue economic or any other application there is a significant degradation in the sonar performance so from a technology perspective and when i say significant it's close to about 60 to 70% degradation so when we try to import technology or import know how we must keep in mind that there is a lot of customization required or a lot of indigenous effort required to make it work in our waters now when we look at the brahmaputra the size and the various other parameters are extremely different and when you look at the bahumaputra basin itself you can see so many countries are affected and today this is strategically become a very very important hot spot now we must look at the people economy and nature and how do we balance this the communities are dependent on it. so there is a socio cultural socio economic aspect we aspire for development there is a lot of focus by the government to look at bigger projects and how but these projects must find a balance between the sustainability now these water bodies or these basins are also responsible for a lot of climate change or balance uh, or maintaining the balance in the nature so if we do not understand the multi dimensional aspects we will go wrong now this is a very unique thing i mean the river dolphins or we call them the freshwater dolphins are very unique in the sense that these creatures are blind they perceive the environment through sound and what we call acoustic vision now lot of conservation efforts sometimes undermine the acoustic part of it lot of effort has gone in i mean there can be no doubt on that but unless we are also able to take note of the acoustic part of it i mean they are blind and they perceive even for uh, navigation for communication for finding mates whole lot of biologically critical functions they depend on sound so unless we take note of the acoustic aspect uh, we will not be able to drive a comprehensive conservation effort i mean you can see the snot that is the sonar that they have they can direct they form i mean as a naval uh, uh, researcher i can tell you they have the most sophisticated sonars now we can see these kind of strandings of course these are not river uh, creatures these are big whales the first one is a 40 feet blue whale in the uh, western coast of india second is a 50 feet bright whale these are very recent stranding incidents and we must take note that these are severe manifestations of the degradation and these are because of the high noise in the underwater domain and we call it the acoustic habitat degradation water resource management is another very very critical aspect of the underwater domain that we talk about you can see uh, there is a severe shortage of water across the country the northeast is still doing well but unless we take immediate measures i think this uh, will go very soon even water quality management whether it is biological or chemical contamination that's a very serious issue and i think we need to take note and uh, bring 
frameworks that can take care of this in a comprehensive manner. Now, when we look at any kind of governance mechanism, do domain awareness becomes a very, very important part. But unfortunately, what has happened, I mean, in the maritime domain, the maritime domain awareness uh, became a very, very important uh, terminology. And But my worry is that this remained uh, uh, event-driven. I mean, after the 9-11 in the US and 26-11 in our uh, West Coast or in Bombay, the MDA became a very, very important terminology in the strategic circles. But it missed out that the security-driven formulations sometimes are not, able, are not inclusive and they, they have a limitation in terms of participation by the other communities. When I say communities, I'm talking about the blue economic communities, the scientific communities. And that, uh, and because of that, the MDA has remained on surface. The underwater component of MDA has somehow uh, not achieved uh, what would be the most desired. Now, the stakeholders are very well known. Now, in terms of maritime security, we can see, I mean, when I talk about the freshwater systems also, uh, underwater drones and various, I mean, we know uh, the Northeast is uh, disturbed and there are security concerns. But this can add a very, very different dimension and this can be very, very disruptive. So we have to take steps wherein we are able to manage the security. There are such mega projects. And imagine uh, one such incident in those regions. So we have to take this very, very seriously and we have to be also prepared for a very, very uh, disruptive kind of a, uh, and with the non-state actors being active, I think that's the asymmetry that they have. In terms of blue economy, I think it's well known there's enough resources, uh, uh, oil and gas is a very, very important, Northeast is known for that. Uh, the fish stock is also a very, very important uh, resource available, but uh, we all know that the fish stock is on the decline and the bycatch is at a very, very high level. So how do we reconcile this? We need to have a lot of uh, monitoring mechanism and the most important, a regulatory mechanism, which can uh, kind of take care of these uh, kind of imbalances. There are a lot of uh, uh, resources, even uh, uh, precious uh, minerals are there which need to be exploited. Now, again, the sustainability is a major issue. I mean, we talk about the inland water transport. Bahamaputra, the siltation is of a very, very different kind. Unless we understand the sediment transport, we will not be able to keep pace with the siltation that is going on. And we, I mean, dredging should be the last resort. I mean, many projects across, I can tell you, which have become unsustainable because of heavy dependence on the dredging there are many other ways where we can minimize the dredging environment the now the dolphin uh, is a very important creature we call it hihu in, uh, uh, in the brahmaputra it is blind and it depends on sound with so much traffic there is going to be a very very severe impact on the uh, uh, freshwater dolphins so how do we navigate development? I'm not here to be a showstopper. So how do we bring uh, measures which will uh, allow sustainable shipping to continue? Disaster management, you can uh, you can see, I mean, there are, this is also, a, I mean, these are seismic prone areas. So how do we, I mean, I'm not here to say that we can stop a natural disaster, but with better early warning systems, which can definitely minimize the loss of life and property. So there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of the UDA or the underwater domain awareness. Uh, how do we apply more and more science and technology? How, I mean, it's not possible to put sensors all across. How do we build smart systems? How do we uh, use data from various other sources uh, so that uh, we can minimize the cost and build smart systems? And more involvement of uh, people. I mean, uh, the young students, as I understand, are not even aware of such mega projects. There is so much opportunities for them. But unless they are rightly skilled or they are employable, uh, it will be difficult for them to find good opportunities. Now, this is the UDA framework that we have uh, defined. You can see the cube, the four faces of the cube represent the four stakeholders that we mentioned. But as we know, the tropical waters have severe suboptimal performance of the sonar that are deployed for any kind of underwater survey. So the focus has to be on acoustic capacity building. And this uh, cube also symbolizes how all these stakeholders can come together. They may have their own requirements, but they need to pool in resources and synergize the effort 
to build more and more uh, site specific r and d inputs and deployment of better science and technology into this and if you see the vertical construct sensing analysis and regulations typically today we see a top down approach where even the policy or the uh, regulatory framework we uh, import from outside uh, which doesn't work in our water and somehow you know it becomes a very very uh, kind of chaotic situation so we have to do a lot of sensing have to understand our waters our conditions better and then do application specific analysis and then move on to the policy framework this also gives uh, a lot of policy directions for the government or for the uh, policy makers in terms of how they can allocate priority how they can allocate resources uh, for science and technology or various infrastructure uh, you know it will give a much more structured approach just to break it down into smaller parts underwater radiated noise now so much uh, vessels will be plying mm -hmm. but the same uh, uh, technology or the know how can be developed for various other applications and uh, everybody can pool in their resources and come together to build a better framework similarly even sediment management i mean the navigability of the uh, for the inland water is a very ma uh, major crisis uh, we uh, frequently see a lot of incidences uh, even from a strategic security perspective also our assets have to move uh, very smoothly so how do we all come together to have a better policy and technology intervention and also capacity building this is the uda framework uh, user industry uh, academy industry partnership there are already so many schemes the government has announced we just need to tap into that and uh, kind of formulate a broader framework where uh, all the stakeholders can come together and take the benefit out of the new domain that emerges out of this. I'll not go into the details of it. Uh, this is one of the uh, innovations that we have done based on the AIS data, the automated identification system data that is available in the sea. And a similar system is being built, but I think the enough priority is not being given for the river information system. That can be used for various purposes. I mean, one is uh, uh, even for monitoring security in the river, uh, collision avoidance uh, for the platforms, navigational safety, a whole lot of things uh, can be monitored. And this is what we have done for the underwater noise. Now, the dolphins are very, very sensitive to the underwater noise. So we can uh, create a real-time monitoring system like this and probably give very, very clear inputs for the policy uh, makers, how uh, the sustainability can also be, I mean, the SDG 14, which is life below water, the very, very important thing, and how that can be ensured. Now, UDA for the river system, sediment management, as I've talked, navigation, water resource management, water quality management, environment impact assessment, acoustic habitat degradation, whole lot of other applications are also there. I will not go into the details of it. Uh, riverine communities are very, very important. Unless we are able to bring them on board, uh, I think there will be various other issues that will uh, kind of emerge. So uh, we have to make sure that these tools, I mean, typically what we see that these communities are left out, even the financial institutions are not ready to come forward. And because of the high uncertainty in their livelihood practices, uh, uh, the financial institutions are also not able to come forward and support them. By bringing technology tools, I think we can uh, bring uh, far more certainty in their uh, outputs or deliverables. And that will uh, give more confidence and that will kind of help these communities uh, scale up their even uh, their traditional practices. Finally, governance becomes a very, very important thing. So I think we need to move towards the digital ocean uh, framework. I mean, ocean may be a uh, wrong word here, but a, a digital rivers uh, system or whatever we want to call it, where far more transparency and far better governance mechanism. So uh, we have been doing a lot of sensitization program last five years. We've been reaching out and uh, we do these summer schools uh, for the students uh, and the faculty, but we also have uh, young professionals joining us. And it's a two way process where even the decision makers, policy makers come and interact uh, on this platform and uh, it's a two-way exchange of ideas uh, and even uh, the industry comes on board so the young students also get to know what the opportunities uh, th that are waiting for them 
uh, you can see a lot of senior people coming forward and uh, participating and really supporting us in a big way. We do a lot of field work. Uh, we have done work in the Kharakwasta Lake. It's a freshwater system. And we have developed a significant uh, uh, field uh, experimental uh, modeling and simulation uh, expertise. So you can see various uh, equipments uh, were deployed. And we got a lot of support from the National Defense Academy when we did this program. So I would uh, suggest uh, outreach, engage, and sustain uh, three-step methodology where outreach is such webinars and seminars and workshops where we interact, discuss various issues. Engage is uh, initiating certain fellowships and internships for young students and also uh, certain uh, workshops for the senior uh, policymakers and stakeholders uh, so that uh, we can get people on board. And the connect is required, the young People, once they get trained and they are capable or they are employable, where do they go? So that connect has to be built uh, very, very seamlessly. And the sustain is initiating projects where we start uh, giving policy inputs and also technology inputs or basically the framework for policy and technology interventions. And in the process, the acoustic capacity and capability building happens. And we have proposed a unique uh, model for the center of excellence where we have a multidisciplinary research center an incubation center where so many startup ideas uh, can be looked at. We already have many of them. Uh, we are working now to set up an incubation center. Skilling, because skilling is a very important aspect. There is hardly any academic institution or center where I see these kind of aspects being worked on or being taken up. Uh, academic center, a lot of courses are required. We uh, have been lucky. Uh, AICT has approved some of our courses. Many more are being now uh, put up for approval. And of course, a policy center or a strategy center. Thank you so much. I think I'll stop for now. I'll now uh, request uh, Dr. Anjal Prakash is a research director and adjunct associate professor at Bharti School of Public Policy, Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. Before joining ISB, Dr. Prakash worked with the Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi, as an associate professor in the Department of Regional Water Studies. His earlier association was with the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Kathmandu, Nepal, where he was the coordinator of the program Himalayan Adaptation, Water and Resilience Research on Glacier and Snowpack develop, uh, Dependent River Basins. Before joining ICI MOD in 2014, Dr. Prakash led the South Asia Consortium for Interdisciplinary Water Resource Studies as an executive director. Uh, Seki Waters is a South Asian think tank that works in six countries of South Asia. His earlier association were with WaterAid, New Delhi, Water and Sanitation Management Organization, Gandhinagar, Gujarat, and Viksat, Ahmedabad, India. Dr. Prakash, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Arnav, for a very generous introduction. Uh, let me just first share my presentation. I'll, uh, yes, here you go. Okay, so uh, what I ought to do in next couple of minutes is just to take you through uh, the IPCC's recent report. Um, as all of you know that uh, IPCC reports are uh, the uh, highest scientific body. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I've been uh, you know, fortunate to be part of uh, the IPCC for about seven to eight years now. At this moment, uh, I was being part of first report on what we call the special report on oceans and cryosphere that went around three years. Now, last four years, we have been researching on uh, the working group two, which actually looks into uh, the uh, adaptation vulnerabilities issues, uh, so climate change. So I'm going to give you key highlights of the report. Um, just yesterday night, actually, the third part of the report has also been come, which looks into mitigation issues. Uh, so that uh, mm, uh, that report is also come. So I'm going to do, just give you a span of what is uh, what are the key issues around that. And then I'll jump into uh, the issues of Brahmaputra. I have been fortunate as part of EC mode. I have uh, worked in the Brahmaputra region and looked at some of the issues. So very quickly, I'll throw them out. Uh, so my 
uh, approaches more questions than answers because I think uh, the, the we need to uh, really uh, you know look at some of the issues that is around uh, climate change and it's uh, looking into from the security perspective also it has a lot of challenges that to take it forward. So let me just give you um, yeah and there are five key points that I'd like to bring it um, on the table uh, based on the recent report. Uh, the first point which has come up very well um, is that climate change is already occurring. It's here and now. So it's not something that, you know, we're 10 years before, 15 years before, if you would ask anybody, they will about climate change, they said, yeah, we know that's coming, but not sure if it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, you know, scientifically proven that everything is related to climate change. Now, I think we have much more evidence um, that um, uh, the climate change is uh, is uh, ca causing a lot of uh, you know, problems that we face as of now, especially the environment problem. Uh, the second point, which is also uh, coming, is uh, is that even if we succeed in limiting global temperature rises to about 1.5 degree. Uh, and the limit countries to agree uh, 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 to target uh, at COP26, we will still face more extreme weathers, event drought, floods, heat waves, and sea level rises. So uh, the window of uh, opportunities for us is closing, and that means that we need to cooperate. And um, uh, uh, I'll come to the Madhramputra region where we require a lot more cooperation because most of the rivers that we have in South Asia are actually uh, transboundary river and. Um, Climate change is bringing compounding problems. So that is one. And these are all glacier fled rivers. Also, Brahmaputra River is also glacier fled river. So, um, the, you know, there is a different uh, kind of hydrology of this river which uh, governs, and that we need to probably look into those issues. That's point number one. Second is what we are seeing is that uh, risk is also magnifying and adaptation has own limit. So there's a limit to which we can adapt to climate change. So the, as I said earlier, the window is closing. We have actually about 15 to 20 years time when we need to cooperate. If we are not cooperating, that means that we will be breaching the uh, some of the limits of the uh, you know, uh, environmental uh, or other limits of the planetary boundaries, as we call it. And that means that the at that time, even adaptation is, is uh, will be very difficult for us to do. So some of the points here coming, um, how a risk being magnified. So looking at, for example, heat waves at this moment, North India is reeling under heat waves, drought, wildfire, um, and other extremes have increased in frequency and also intensity far beyond the natural variability. So that's one. Second is also about this hazard, how have they substantially damaging the ecosystems across the globe and in the, some of the regions it is actually leading to what we call the irreversible loss of uh, some of the species which are extinct and uh, you know uh, uh, which other platform other than maritime research center uh, which actually looks into these issues also could also be uh, you know uh, of importance for them and we found in our report that uh, certain species in the in the marine environment are actually going extinct which are very important for the ecosystems to survive especially the marine ecosystem then looking at how global warming is also if it is unchecked left unchecked how are these uh, climate hazards will be um, increasing many fold and how are we reaching at the point of what we call the hard limit of adaptation and that means that we are uh, you know we, we will be reaching uh, those points and that means uh, uh, adaptation will be very very difficult for us to go for that's point number two uh, let me just go to the third point, which is um, which is very important. Also, as you know, that uh, we um, India is about uh, the level of urbanization in India is about thirty five percent this moment. We um, will be adding uh, by twenty forty itself. We'll be adding a couple of more crores, about sixty crore people altogether will be uh, living in urban areas, as per their projections are showing. Um, so large portion of our urban city urban areas actually have a much uh, greater risk of uh, um, in, uh, what we call the climate induced hazard um, more than about in if you look at the uh, worldwide more than 1 billion people are living actually in low lying settlements and they face hazards such as sea level rise subsiding coast and also flooding uh, of high tides um, 350 million people, urban residents live in the threat of water scarcity and I think Arnab has uh, in his presentation has also discussed about water scarcities in this region and if we look at it from the uh, from the Brahmaputra region uh, you have the basin which is increasingly urbanizing uh, and also increasingly risk uh, in terms of climate uh, water security so cities are at much greater risk than ever before uh, in our point of history that's point number three then we look at uh, Point number four, which is actually about how 
life's lively livelihoods are changing in climate and environmentally stressed areas and brahmaputra region where i have actually done very uh, intensive research and ground level work we know that uh, people's their, their livelihood lives and livelihood are directly dependent on uh, on uh, the climate uh, and environmental resources that we have this in fact picture is of of lower uh, brahmaputra region uh, in bangladesh uh, where um, uh, where uh, we're looking at how uh, <clears throat> because of the changes in the river ecology uh, uh, increasingly people are facing problems especially those who are directly dependent on the river water for irrigation for even fisheries and other things so that's another point uh, and uh, uh, because uh, the south asian region is also a hot spot region uh, we see that these impacts are also very gendered in nature and we found that uh, men are migrating because the uh, environmentally stressed region um, the migration is the only way through which people are surviving uh, so part of the family when the men migrate because of gendered relations that we have women are actually at the forefront of economy you find them everywhere uh, and uh, i always say that women do three three shifts uh, starting uh, you know as early as three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning and sleeping at 11 or 12 o'clock in the night um, you, know, uh, you know helping uh, uh, children looking after the field um, also trying to gather uh, fuel wood firewood i mean you name it we have it there so women's drudgery has Im increased many many fold climate actually change is a force multiplier so we already had a uh, unequal gender relationship and i i I think Chuchita is here. Uh, she will be speaking a lot more. She has, her work is uh, very much focused on these areas. Uh, but um, I I always say that women do are doing triple shift to cope, and that is something that increasingly we are finding it. Evidences are there, and uh, there aren't much uh, more, you know uh, solutions coming forward. How do we we check this uh, this uh, problem? And that is uh, you know a point of worry. Um, then we're looking at how. Uh, and if you if you uh, uh, look at it from the uh, Indian perspective, uh, we are at much greater risk. And uh, climate change uh, uh, is posing threats from all sides. You know, look at Himalayas for example. The glaciers are melting uh, uh, at very much fast rate. Earlier, we actually when I was working in EC mode, uh, the kind of data that we have was that by by end of the century, two third of the glaciers will be uh, retreating. Uh, now the recent models have have shown us that by 2050 itself some of these early uh, you know uh, because of the global warming some of the uh, uh, <coughs> glaciers have also already showing a huge decline and that is something that is a region of worry because uh, glaciers uh, in the region of Hindu Kush Himalayan region uh, support 10 uh, major river basins and the nectar is actually Kalash Mansarovar from where all the rivers originate it provides base flow for the entire region and about 1.3 billion humanities actually dependent on the water uh, from this river so not only the river in the mountain but how river is feeding downstream areas are very very important Brahmaputra river included and if you look at the map of Brahmaputra it actually originates from from, uh, from uh, Kailash Manso and travels all the way to China and, and uh, comes to India and then drains in Bangladesh. Um, amazing river ecology that it has in supporting populations all the way. Uh, this is at a much, much greater risk uh, as we ever had in humanities. That's what. So climate, uh, the glaciers uh, are melting. Then you have the coastal areas, you know, uh, in the region. India has about 7,500 uh, 7, kilometers of coastline. When you look at South Asia, Bangladesh um, has about 580 um, kilometers pakistan has about 1000 kilometers of coastline um, uh, sri lanka is 1620 kilometers of coastline these are the areas uh, which are um, which has much more compounded you know problems because of the sea level rise also what has happened uh, you know the oceans have sunk in the carbon um, and that's the because of the so much of carbon we have polluting uh, oceans and uh, water uh, ocean water actually is the first one to sink this carbon apart from the uh, uh, <coughs> forest that we have uh, and because that that ocean has become much more warmer more acidic and less productive. 
that means a lot of people who were dependent earlier on the maritime you know resources especially the fish resources the fish production has been reported it will be very very it's declining second thing what it has done is that it has activated the water cycle in the in the uh, coastal regions and that is leading to cyclones so if you will find that the number of cyclones and the the frequency of the cyclone and the severity of cyclone has increased in last 10 to 15 years earlier you hear about cyclone once in a year or something like that in the bay of bengal now you'll find even this time we found pre summer uh, cyclone which has never been heard of in the 100 years of the history we have actually only about eight such incidences this time we have seen even pre summer months and uh, you know cyclone which has developed in certain parts of india uh, you know affecting india and it has actually landed in uh, in uh, in uh, <clears throat> andaman nicobar had a landfall so so these uh, uh, kind of incidents are going to be much more pronounced in future and uh, hitting it is going to hit hard from all so 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 my question my uh, proposition here is that india is not saved you have from the Himalayas are hitting hard, from the bottom you're up, you're, you've been hit hard. Then you also have semi-rid economy. In the middle, what we have is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, about 54% of India's landmass is actually either semi-rid or arid regions. And that means there the heat wave is going to be hitting very hard. And that means uh, that we uh, we are not saved anywhere. So if you, if anyone of you are listening to me, you will know that earlier climate change used to be, you know, page five, six, seven phenomena now you'll hear about climate change issues on page one and two and that's where it brings in that these issues are much more pronounced than ever in our history and that is why we need to talk about it and i'm glad that the institute like maritime research institute is is actually bringing in these issues as part of the security concern and that's something that we really need to do i'm not a security personnel you know in an expert in that sense but i what as what i can put forward is the science uh, which is there which may impact the security of the region and that's something that is we need to do now let me just come very quickly on two points on the brahmaputra river management challenges and opportunities so um, uh, how does it this these issues coming out from the ipcc report how does that impact brahmaputra river so um, uh, we uh, we have seen already uh, anub has shown us uh, the uh, what we call the uh, Brahmaputra River Basin. But if you see from here, this is actually, this is the place from where Clash Kalash Mansarovar is there, which is actually called the nectar of the earth because most of the river, about 10 rivers in Asia, not only South Asia, a Asia actually comes from, from Kalash Mansarovar. That's something that is, I did not know this till I joined uh, EC mode. And then when, the, when they were, were shown the map and seen why is it so important in our culture, in our history. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to save these resources which are very very precious resources so look at how the river is actually traveling in china all the way and then coming all the way to india and draining in bangladesh and this is how the river looks like um, uh, thing but there's some of the issues that i like to flag here especially from the climate change uh, problem so definitely it's a climate change hotspot region uh, we also see that the uh, uh, water related risks and disasters are increasing you you will see that the floods that is coming every year uh, that is bringing in a lot of uh, distress because of the uh, kind of devastation it brings in and one doesn't know what kind of a precipitation happens and how does it happen and climate change actually has disturbed the water cycle it has disturbed the monsoon patterns and that's why it is leading to a lot of uh, water related risk and disasters that's point number two Point number three is also about how it is infusing what we call the severe weather event or the freak weather events. And that means incessant rainfall, you have glacial decline. These are issues which are uh, contributing to this problem. Plus, the global temperature is rising. As we know that we already have reached about 1.1 degree of warming um, from the pre-industrial age. Uh, now, um, it, uh, it the first target was that we should not be more warmer, more warmer than 1.5 degree uh, by end of the century, but that is, will be reaching only by 2050 as per the recent climate change report, IPCC report. That means we are now talking about two degree warming. They're keeping our you know act, act together, putting our acts together so that we don't go beyond two degree warming. Now, just for a general people, I'm sure they're experts here, but for general people for the understand how does it matter how much how warm we are uh, does it really matter it does because each fraction of warming contributes to what we call uh, you know act as i said activating the water cycle or bringing in drought or making changes in the environment system 
and that means that our livelihood lives uh, all species around us uh, ecosystems all of us are, of us are in danger and that's uh, that's why the fraction of warming each fraction of warming needs to be checked and that means we need to come together because warm global warming is is a global phenomena so what happens in america is our concern what happens in china is our concern what happens in india is also our concern and that's why we need to uh, you know uh, we need to uh, uh, have a coordinated voice to check uh, uh, global warming wherever it is emanating from so that's the third point fourth point we also see that this is one of the region which has a huge level of poverty and deprivation as i've already talked about how women are facing the brunt of the um, vagaries of nature as well as the changing climate systems but it's also one of the most poorest region most of the most densely populated region every inch is cultivated there's no one place that you'll find fellow uh, that means that people slowly depend on the environment resources i always say that you know people like arnab and i are salaries are actually independent of the environment system whatever if it rains if it is drought outside doesn't matter to us our salary check will be given to us right at the end of the um, month but look at people who are under this or 60 percent of population who directly depends on what happens in the nature so if it uh, if uh, if you have a if you are a farmer in banputra region or any of the any of the districts in banputra for example and if you are cultivating a crop and suddenly uh, the flood comes from the upper reaches and then washes away your three months or four months of your uh, you know your entire production that you've good labor that you put in the time that you have put in and then you have nowhere to go what do you do then you migrate you the only thing that you have to offer is your own labor so then men migrate and they become rickshaw pullers in dhaka uh, they become you know uh, they they migrate to um, uh, to guwahati and then do some odd jobs in the construction worker this is how people are surviving and these are un invisible people they are not known because this is not captured by census data this is not captured by the you know local level understanding and that is what this is bringing in much more problem because they are invisible people they are not seen if you are not seen how will you make policies to support them and that's why ground level work is important i'll come to last book point because i think i've spoken enough arnab um, just last two points before i close uh, we also have what we call the um, the gender inequity issues i've already outlined some of these things so i'll not dwell upon this but about caste and the inequality that have we have the in income income inequality if you look at uh, you know the small holders people, uh, population or people with without land in this region that's also huge and that means that uh, that the fruit of development is not equitably distributed to all the people all the time and that means you require certain very strong social policies to support the downtrodden people who are at the bottom of the society or bottom of the pyramid as some people call it uh, we need to protect their interests because um, they are the they are the one who grew uh, you know who are um, your uh, if if they migrate they become your maid in in your household they become your auto rickshaw driver they, these are the people who actually and most of them i see are actually what we call the climate refugees and that's when we need to be much more sensitive towards these people need last point i would say as from the security perspective these are shared basins and i have already told you how it is you know a couple of countries bhutan india bangladesh and china there are four countries uh, involved in managing brahmaputra uh, or at least uh, brahmaputra is passing through these countries um, we need to share data and because of security concerns and the concerns that we have there is not much of cooperation which is happening india and bangladesh for example share 64 rivers we have only one treaty um, uh, which is uh, uh, ganga treaty and the tista treaty is still not up uh, there are so much of uh, you know um, <clears throat> issues a uh, couple of years before when manmohan singh landed in uh, in uh, <coughs> bangladesh and we were expecting that the treaty will be signed uh, there was a block from one of the states in india which i don't want to name here at this moment uh, so this is the issue which you have the state issues becomes more prominent than the national interest of the region and of the region also so i would actually when i was doing recently field work uh, uh, you know and there's a border of uh, uh, India and Bangladesh, uh, when Tista River was there, and then Bang in West Bengal, upper reaches of West Bengal, just 15 kilometers before the border of uh, uh, 
uh, Bangladesh, there's a barrage which has been which has been erected. Water uh, actually impounds, and the the downstream areas actually uh, drought uh, feeling. Uh, you know, they they're experiencing drought because the water has been impounded there on the top. Because we don't have any treaty for water sharing, um, uh, you know, people from other sides actually are are disbenefited by those things process. West Bengal has not built in enough infrastructure so that they can use that water, but they impound the water and don't give that water back to the, um, uh, you know, to Bangladesh. And that these are things. So I ask them, what happens if this is the another, if this is another state or another district of India, would you not share the water? You know, so something that, that we need to probably go beyond our in national interest, so-called national interest and the bind boundaries, and then try to look at it from the poverty and the deprivation perspective and see that, you know, your fellow um, uh, uh, human being is actually this this been deprived by uh, the the you know kind of uh, policies that you have, and this is what I would end here. That if we do not act now, I think there will be compounded disbenefit for the entire region, and you and I will not be saved. That's what I will end it here for. Thank you so much for listening to me. Over to you, Dr. Prakash. Uh, definitely a very comprehensive, and we could see the width and uh, the depth of your study and uh, the understanding of the subject and the region. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you giving us your perspective. Pleasure is uh, all mine. Thank you so would, much. Yeah. Next, I would request Dr. Nilanjan Ghosh. He's the director, Center for new economic diplomacy observer research foundation and the orf's kolkata center his previous positions at various points in time include senior fellow and head of economics at orf kolkata senior vice president and chief economist at the mcx i limited in mumbai and professor of econometrics at the terry school of advanced studies in new delhi dr ghosh has been nominated by the honorable supreme court of india as member expert committee for formulating scientific and policy guidelines with respect to cutting trees for developmental projects. A natural resources economist and an econometrician by training, Dr. Ghosh obtained his PhD from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Dr. Ghosh have, has various publications in his name and he's a regular columnist in uh, various national uh, dailies. Dr. Ghosh, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Mr. Das, and thank you for inviting me to this extremely interesting deliberation. And uh, especially let me thank Anjal for his presentation because it was not only comprehensive, it was not only informative, it was uh, especially because he brought in the Tista issue, which of course is also a Brahmaputra issue. It's one of the tributaries of the Brahmaputra. And eventually if one talks about the Tista, it's not merely uh, a single layered transboundary issue, but it is exposed to what we call a two-level game. And uh, frankly speaking, it is not national interest which inhibits any kind of this stuff treaty, but it is the state interest. So I'll, I'll also touch upon this while talking off. But uh, since uh, the concentration today is mainly on the mainstream Brahmaputra, let me just uh, formulate that and then I will also come to this stuff. Now, now uh, there is something very interesting that came up in Anjal's presentation, which I really like that is related to poverty. Now, if you look at this entire GBM, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna Basin, as such, you find that uh, there's a very interesting development paradox in here. Now, I'm not, though, in fact, you have asked me, uh, Mr. Das, to talk about geostrategic issues. I'm not a geostrategic person, as you might have seen in my CV. I'm an economist by training. But all I do is to read the data and maybe try to conclude a few things. So this interesting development paradox is all about which uh, uh, Professor Bandupadha is also here, Jayanto Bandupadha and I formulated long back, ample water, ample poverty. Now, in this ample water, ample poverty paradox, what essentially emerges is that, that why essentially we do not get into the right kind of use of water for the developmental purpose, something that is going to help us out. because. There are indigenous practices of essentially managing the water. There were practices by way of which we used to put flood water to optimum use prior to the colonial era. And it is essentially colonial engineering which changed the entire dimension of water governance in this part of the world. And, uh, and, and they brought in what we call the reductionist engineering paradigm, construction of dams and barrages 
which eventually lead to rather treating water as something like not essentially as an ecological entity, but something like a stock of resource which is going to be used as per human need. But water or a river is not a stock, it's a flow. And it's a flow which uh, has been formulated lately by Bandopadhyay. I'm just reiterating his terms. That is the waves, water, energy, biodiversity, sediment. But there is another element beyond the waves that is the society. Apart from water, energy, biodiversity, sediment, there's the social dimension to it and the cultural dimension as well. But if I stick to waves, water, energy, biodiversity, sediment, this is essentially a dynamic equilibrium. The dynamic equilibrium in the sense that the Himalayan system, river system, essentially carries water. Along with it, it carries energy. It sustains the biodiversity in the process. The downstream biodiversity provides ecosystem services to the community, broader community as a whole. It carries a host, a huge amount of sediment along with it. Now, this sediment, which you mentioned, of course, has its own problems, but it also provides ecosystem services because the flow by the liquid flow by itself carries the solid flow, that is the sediment. And the sediment goes farther down to the delta, uh, to the plains, and then to the delta, eventually helps in the soil formation. This is a very, very important service, uh, an important, what we call a supporting service of the ecosystem. Now, let me come to the Brahmaputra context. And since you want me to talk about some of the geostrategic issues, let me also bring it here. Now, uh, especially, especially about uh, the China dimension first, Let, then I will come to the Tista dimension. Now, ever since uh, the publication of uh, Brahma Chelani's magnum opus, especially Water, Asia's New Battleground in 2011, the media and the public perception of uh, the possibility of chi China's Chinese diversion of the Brahmaputra River become widespread. And uh, I, I neither want to validate nor contest China's intents towards downstream India. China has acted as a hydro hegemon, in fact, in, 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 in most of its, uh, in the context of most of its river basins, including the Mekong. China's growth fetishism and its development ambitions have actually played havoc. In fact, in terms of uh, the ecosystem, there is no doubt about that. As far as the border issues are concerned, that are very much there. But what becomes important is that let us look at a few data before we conclude on the impacts of any form of uh, interventions, upstream interventions on the Brahmaputra. So all I want to state in here is that the scientific information needs to replace large component of public perception that is based on conjectures posed by populist uh, demagoguery and myopic jingoism. As far as the Brahmaputra subbasin is concerned, it is one of the longest, most critical, yes, uh, one of the least understood river basins in the world. Highly complex drainage system, which came out uh, especially in the context of uh, Anjal's presentation as well. It uh, drains parts of uh, southern Tibet, India's northeast, all of Bhutan, and also large part of Bangladesh. It flows across a very, very unique uh, geo-environmental and uh, biophysical setting. Now, out of the total length, Brahmaputra's length is to the tune of 2,880 kilometers. And out of this 2,880 kilometers, around uh, rather 1,625 kilometers flows through the Tibetan plateau as the Yarlung Sangpo. So it's more than 55% of the entire stretch, mainstream stretch, that is the Yarlung Sangpo Brahmaputra Jamuna stretch. Uh, Jamuna is the name of the Brahmaputra in Bangladesh. Is in is in the Tibetan plateau with the name Yarlung Sangpo. Nine hundred eighteen kilometers is in India, and it assumes various names: the Siang, then the Dihang, and the Brahmaputra. And the rest remaining three hundred thirty odd, three hundred thirty-five odd kilometers uh, in Bangladesh has the name Jamuna. Till it merges into the pod, uh, into the Podda or the Padman near Gualondo. Now, this geographical distribution, because if we see that fifty-five percent of the length of the of the mainstream Brahmaputra that is the Yalung Sangpo lies in China, this apparently gives the impression that the geographical boundary around the headwaters carries the maximum flow of the river, which needs to be seen in terms of the actual data. 
Now, there are various hypotheses with the Chinese interventions on the Brahmaputra, and of course, all this emerged from China's unique status. Uh, it's, it started with uh, the China Chinese hydropower projects on the Yalong Sangpo, which was initiated with the Zhangmo Gravity Dam, then a host of other interventions. Now, uh, what, 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 what has also happened is that uh, there, there were also, uh, one needs to understand the flow of the, of the system as such. In most cases, political scientists, strategic thinkers, and international relations specialists have indulged in a very simple linear thinking that if there is maximum amount of water, then any kind of intervention is simply going to dry out India. Now, if the Brahmaputra by itself is identified as the flow downstream of the meeting of three tributaries, namely the Luhit, Dihang, Dibang, and at that to near Sadia in Assam. The link of Brahmaputra with the Yarlung River, which originates from the Angsi Glacier near the Mount Kailash, was discovered rather recently. Now, as a trans Himalayan tributary, the Yarlung is substantially fed by snow and glacial melts in addition to rainfall. But what one needs to know is that, uh, uh, is, is that the normalized, what we call the normalized melt index of the Brahmaputra is in the range of 0 0.15 to 0 0.2. The Tibetan component of the basin, which provides the uh, 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 which provides water to the longest stretch of the Yarlung Sangpo registers a precipitation that averages around 300 millimeters. Contrary to this, as the tributaries cross the Himalayan crest line, the average annual precipitation, because that is on, in the rain shadow, the other part is, the, is in the rain shadow region. Now, contrary to this, as the tributaries cross the Himalayan uh, crest line, the annual average precipitation reaches about 2,000 millimeters. Thus, a very large component of the total annual flow of the Brahmaputra is generated in the southern aspect of the Himalaya in India uh, by tributaries from Buridihing in the east to Tista in the west. And, and this is, I'm talking of estimates from some Chinese scholars, Jiang and his co co colleagues, that the total annual outflow of the Yalung Sangpo in China is estimated to be around 31 billion cubic meters, whereas, so that is in fact uh, near, uh, this, is, this is near Nushia, whereas when it, in, 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 the, in the northern aspect of the Himalaya, from 31 billion cubic meters, when it reaches Bahadurabad in, in Bangladesh, the, that is the gauging station, this annual outflow is 606 billion cubic meters. That means 20 times, almost 20 times. 80% of the flows, rather, if not more, 80 to 85% of the flows of the Brahmaputra emerge within the Indian boundary. And as per government of India estimates, which uh, Mr. Das you so showed, in fact, in, in one of the slides, surplus, though, in fact, ecologically, we cannot call a river basin surplus because every drop of water has its uh, ecological function. There is not, nothing surplus or a deficit. This is a very anthropocentric way of looking at things. Yes, I agree with that. But out of this, they essentially, government of India provides two measures. One is the renewable water resource. The other is the potentially utilizable water resource. Now, barely 25% of the renewable water resource is potentially utilizable or has been harnessed. Now, moisture-laden winds from the Bay of Bengal entered the Tibetan plateau through a corridor that extends along the Brahmaputra and Siang rivers until Arunachal Pradesh and thereafter through the Yarlung into Tibet. Apart from this, you have the foothills which are fed by anomalous uh, precipitation of magnitude that is again able to cause great floods. So, so now the issue is that if you talk of pure economic use of water or human use of water, a large component of the water around 80, even, even during the dry season, let me also put this across, that during the summer season, essentially the, the component or the percentage contribution of the Yarlung Sangpo is even lower. It is to the tune of 5 to 7%. So, the, if these are the figures, to what extent essentially upstream intervention can divert water or cause economic harm, let me put this term economic harm rather than because ecosystems has a different connotation altogether, to downstream India is definitely questionable. So, so even if we get into any form of negotiation, these data need to be kept in mind. 
Now there is another aspect to this entire China India relation that is in relation to data sharing on the Yalung Sangpo or the Brahmaputra. There was an MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, which was first signed in 2008, which governs the arrangement of data sharing between the two nations on the Yalung Sangpo. And this is essentially for facilitating the floods during the summer monsoon periods, that is between 15th of May and 15th of October. And this data is related to water level discharge and rainfall and shared from three stations. These three stations in, 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 the, in, the, in the Tibetan boundary, uh, that is these three stations are Nugesha, Yankun, and Nushia for these few months, and they are supposed to be shared twice daily. That is one at uh, 5.30 a.m. in the morning, the other is 5.30 p.m. in the evening. Now this MOU was operational during 2008 to 12. Then a follow-up MOU was signed in 2013 for extending this exchange of flow data of the Yelling Sangpo during flood season. Then it was again renewed in 2018. Now the issue is that, that uh, the MOU also has the provision uh, of data sharing if the water level is close to the warning level during the uh, non-flood season. In return, India is required to share information regarding data utilization in flood forecasting and mitigation apart from uh, paying a certain fixed amount of money. Now this exchange works in conjunction with uh, the establishment of an institutional mechanism, the India-China expert level ELM on, on transboundary rivers. Now, as far as these stations are concerned, what has happened is that the average annual rainfall in, in, in those parts, especially if one takes into consideration Shigatse and Lhasa, this is around 169.5 millimeters in Shigatse, in Lhasa it is around 400 uh, millimeters. This reaches, this becomes much higher, in fact, farther downstream as you uh, cross the Himalayan crest line. Near, near Tuting, after you cross the Himalayan crestline, it is 767 millimeters. So it's many times. And farther downstream, it becomes to the tune of almost 1500 millimeters. So the data from, uh, I, mean, I mean, the stations from where we are getting the data is simply not sufficient to predict the kind of flooding mechanism or suppose a flash floods or any kind of cloudburst mechanism that can happen farther downstream. Whereas if you look at, compare it with uh, Guwahati or Tejpur or Bahadurabad, or even suppose to Dibrugar, it, it's way high. It's to the tune of uh, 2,000, 2,500 millimeters. So, so even when we made this choice of stations, of collecting the data, the systems are not proper. So uh, this is also because of, we, I don't know whether this is uninformed signs that led to this kind of uh, mechanism. Or, or it was deliberate, or what is it? At the point it uh, leaves uh, China, uh, uh, the, uh, especially at the Great Bend, the river becomes so fat, the precipitation is so high, that if something happens near, uh, say, at, at the point uh, called Medog, where, where essentially it is entering India, uh, the precipitation turns out to be almost five times and any kind of uh, you know i mean extreme event happening there is simply going to have a deleterious impact for the downstream in arunachal whatever happening is nushia is not going to help in fact uh, or, or have any impact for the downstream in arunachal so the choice of stations out here has also been flawed to a large extent so these are the two important things. In fact, I just, just wanted to flag out the data issues uh, and, and how essentially we have indulged in a wrong form of agreements and wrong form of negotiations. Even these are being showed by the relative hydrographs. Uh, when, when you look at, uh, suppose, say, the Selazong or, or, or suppose they come to Bahadurabad and Guwahati, it's, it's around almost 10 to, 10, to, 10 to 12 times. That's how it, it increases. Now, in fact, let me just touch upon the issue with the Tista, because that was also touched upon earlier. And Tista, of course, is part of the entire Brahmaputra system. Whereas that was the issue as far as India and China are concerned. The Wherever the Brahmaputra starts, begins, suppose uh, we just uh, talked about the Pasighat and, and, and till Bahadurabad, the Brahmaputra can be classified as a wild river. Wild river in the sense it is unimpeded. There is no obstruction. It retains its horizontal. Uh, it retains its integrity, 
and the flow regime is uh, definitely substantial to to uh, to maintain the ecological integrity of the basin ecosystem other issues are of course climate change and other issues have already been talked of but when it comes to the tista tista is a highly intervened river this is also because of the fact that it's it's not merely an issue of uh, west bengal and bangladesh tista ha has a long stretch in fact in sikkim and there are to the tune of uh, i i in fact conducted field work and drove down the upstream of tista right from gajoldoba in west bengal to suppose uh, following the course of the tista to almost uh, at the very first barrage it there are 26 hydropower projects on the tista in sikkim and of this 26 barely 22 are operational there are five hydropower projects in fact in in west bengal now these hydropower projects which anjal was mention, uh, mentioning that impounding is happening in gajoldoba it's not merely in gajoldoba impounding is happening all across the stretch in fact in sikkim because if if one goes around and drives through this uh, 22 operational projects there is a pondage despite the fact that it is claimed that this is a run of the river during dry season what happens is they store the water probably the flow becomes low at times and uh, some of the projects keep on storing water for 18 hours a day and then runs the turbine for 6 hours a day and this completely destroys the river destroys the integrity of the river ecosystem and you will find a hydropower project almost within 5 to 6 kilometers of each other at times so the integrity of the flow regime gets destroyed now what has also happened further downstream is uh if where the impounding is happening in gajoldoba there is a diversion channel diversion channel across uh, uh through through the highway from gajoldoba and that diversion channel takes the water to the to the to the uh, uh, to the cities of which are which are growing every day of jalpaiguri and shiliguri now across these two stretches in fact when you are driving uh through the highway you will find something very interesting that especially during the summer season that on both sides a uh, summer paddy is grown now summer paddy is entirely irrigated this is the boro paddy now uh, this was uh, introduced ever since the green revolution kuch bihar and jalpaiguri they registered a phenomenal growth in the area under boro paddy which has grown by almost 4 to 5 times in the second phase of the green revolution especially if you look at between 1985 to 2022 because of issue water supply from the gajoldoba barrage the uh, paddy cultivation has uh, essentially grown phenomenally now acclaimed as the country's largest project water from the dalia barrage also in fact in bangladesh that has also enabled 16000 acres of uh, pa- i mean acres of paddy cultivation in bangladesh and uh, and all these are under hyv high yielding variety boro paddy cultivation now interestingly what happened in india was that uh, the minimum support price regime has always supported paddy against the drier alternatives that is uh, wheat uh, that is uh, ragi or dry especially the rabi ragi or the rabi millets and this incentivized this is a graph that uh, I, i showed in recently in, in one of my own publications how the terms of trade or the ratio of the minimum support prices of paddy ha Uh, vis-a-vis ragi or or the drier alternatives actually increased or the price ratios increased thereby moving the acreage from the drier alternatives to paddy from ever since the green revolution that is from 1968 till 2005 6 post 2005 6 there has been some restoration of uh, millet cultivation so it is the msp regime as one is the msp regime second is that the food corporation of india the fci and other state procurement agencies they are also procuring paddy at a much higher at the msp and the procurement of paddy and wheat happens the procurement doesn't happen in other crops to such an extent so this is also largely responsible for the extensive uh, uh, water consumption in fact in the tista basin in this part of india as also the water increasing water demand In, uh, in in bangladesh which has where uh, we all know it's it's essentially a rice consuming uh, nation now 
comes the issue which I have always mentioned, as far as Tista is concerned, it's a two-level game. The issue is also with conflictual federalism. Water is a state subject, as far as the Indian constitution is concerned. It is only through the concurrent, uh, through the ISW, the, uh, the Interstate uh, Water Disputes uh, Act, the, that the center can intervene or create some kind of uh, what they call a tribunal. Now, here, even when the Ganges Water Treaty was signed, that was in 1996, the state of West Bengal played an enabling role. Jyoti Basu and Oshim Dash Gupta, who was the finance minister at that point in time, he was instrumental in getting things done. And here it is the state which, because of, uh, naturally because of uh, populist factors, cannot play that, is not playing that enabling role. And eventually, water has been exposed to this, or uh, waters of the Tista have been exposed to this entire uh, quagmire of, of not competitive federalism, but conflictual federalism, that is the conflict between the center and the state. And that is entirely coming in the way of the Tista water treaty between Bangladesh and India. And of course, this has emerged as a thorny issue, extremely thorny issue, no doubt about that. So uh, with that, I'd like to stop here. I think I talked enough for more than half an hour. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, really appreciate uh, you covering uh, the broad spectrum with a lot of ground data. So that makes it very, very convincing. And thank you so much uh, for a very, very insightful uh, uh, talk. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure. Uh, next, I would request uh, Professor Suchitra Sen from the School of uh, Social Sciences, JNU. Uh, she has got over 19 years of experience in domain of natural resources and rural livelihood with her PhD in agriculture, agricultural and economic geography and postdoctoral research in institutions and the natural resources. She has been a part of many international collaborations such as the Gender Atlas by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India and Inter-University Consortium on Stratosphere uh, and <coughs> Climate Change Project of Himalayan Stratospheres. Science and Society funded by DST. She also has many publications under her name and currently associated with the JNU Center of Study of Regional Development School of Social Sciences. Ma'am, the floor is yours. I'm sorry it took a little longer than I thought. So uh, basically, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, do along the Brahmaputra River, the work that I'm borrowing from that is actually done as a uh, as a small part, in fact, smaller part of the second part of a two part project. And I share something with Anjal, which is also I've headed Saki Waters uh, for two years. And this is the work which comes out of that. So this was a project on transboundary water management. But the element which I'm presenting currently is uh, draws from uh, the second part of the project, which really is about hearing people's voice in the ground and what they think of the how they engage with the river, etc. That really, so this is the, there is this duality between who governs the river and who are being governed. So this was an attempt to actually find out uh, people who are being governed, what their voices are, and within that, women's voices. So, uh, but but that is a different thing. But what I'm going to do now is along the river Brahmaputra, I'm trying to chart out taking an axis, I'm a geographer, taking an axis of space, trying to understand the patriarchies and gender relationship along uh, the river. So this was based on actually what I'm going to present is two different things. One is taking on from uh, a work on earlier work on gender atlas. And the second one, which is the main work which I'm referring to is a 21 day field work where I was there for 21 days, but there were other team members in other countries. So Bhutan, India, entirety of Assam and Bangladesh is what we have done. China is not something we were able to cover. So. Uh, Basically, uh, you know, when I say that I'm trying to understand, take space as a framework for understanding gender relationship, uh, the term which has been used is a gender scape. 
And that is what actually I took from the theoretical framework of the empirical work, which I'm going to explain. So spaces, uh, now gender space is something that it, it different spaces of different kind of cultural spaces as different kind of patriarchal norms, different kind of gender relationships, performances and portrayals of men and women. So, uh, I mean, what I'm referring to is draws upon something which Sumi Krishna has written about is about the existential or the lived in spaces uh, of women and men and their relationship. Now, also what the other thing I'm going to do is link uh, the physical and the social. So try to link the river uh, and the physicality of the river with the socio-cultural uh, cultural relationship and see whether there's an overlap or not. And this idea is not new at all, it's quite old. Uh, so to start with, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of hypothesis we start out with is that river valleys generally are have a better quality of land. So historically, they had a better quality of land. And the land values were higher because the productivity of land is higher. And again, historically, the demand for labor was high in these places. So men stayed back and also some hired men were required and they who migrated to these areas to actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, fill in these uh, demands. Uh, property rights were extremely skewed in favor of men in terms of who owned the land and the need for controlling the land and i'm i am taking it for from other studies and actually trying it out empirically uh, are very skewed and therefore uh, the the control of the land vis-a-vis uh, by -vis men makes for a, um, a patriarchal relationship which is uh, very very sharp on the other hand if you look at the mountainous spaces which is where the river originates from uh, the rugged spaces it's less constricting influence on gender mobility for work why because the men from there have actually moved out because again historically the productivity was low so uh, it is poorly connected uh, low fertility uh, of land sparsely populated and therefore low value of land and this therefore creates, uh, therefore women needed to take up at least the workspace because the men ha would migrate from here. Now, even now, so we are trying to see whether we can conform, this pattern is con I mean, conformed to uh, when we are looking at Brahmaputra. So I go to the gender atlas, I'm sorry for the quality of the maps because I've really cut it out from uh, the India map, so they're not very good. But just to show you, when you look at say, female to male uh, uh, work participation rate, that is relative work participation rate, that is female work participation rate divided by male work participation rate. It's the lowest in the valley area, higher, much, much higher in the area which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is mountainous. Again, and here we have only taken Assam because we don't have the map, have the map for Bhutan or for Bangladesh. Again, share of women among cultivators, the same pattern. Uh, percentage of this is something which is about government and infrastructure and there is no reason why there, the water availability would be less in the river uh, in the river valley area but what we see is that the percentage of rural area having treated water uh, source within the premises which would have a bearing on the women's uh, burden of work uh, domestic work and extra domestic work is also poorer in the valley area compared to the hill area. Uh, uh, again, uh, percentage of government schools, primary to secondary, uh, we have taken with girls toilet, which actually uh, has, I mean, post say middle school onwards, whether there's a girl's toilet or not has a bearing on whether there would be a dropout of the girl children. It shows roughly the same thing. A female to male literacy rate, not very clear, but uh, so far so. Like this is what I wanted to show from there. Now I go to the to the uh, you know uh, what we have got from the uh, field. 
and that is much more detailed so uh, there uh, i i'm just i'm because there's no time what we saw was uh, in the upstream area and here i'm considering bhutan and arunachal pradesh uh, where and bhutan in fact it was very favorable because historically uh, women had the ownership of land so uh, it it goes the land ownership actually goes from the mother to the daughter that to the uh, eldest daughter sometimes it is divided i found two different things in different areas and the uh, daughter who will take care of the parents in the old age actually gets the other uh, property which is the household property immov other immovable property so there when we actually interviewed women uh, we found that uh, the rivers ecosystem is understood both by men and women and women are very very clear about now here the relationship of river with the river is very different because the river is down below compared to where the agricultural lands are but still there was i mean the women for example this woman i mean i have got this photograph uh, she was very very clear about you know what that the rainfall is reducing and how the river can be used what kind of pump sets can be used to bring the water which i have not seen in other places in contrast in the down, downstream area uh, uh, as opposed to river as a ecosystem service it was looked on both by men and women as a resource so the view was a little different and there was a sharp gender division of work and women were disconnected from all monetary transactions so women did end up doing a lot of work but those work tends to be undercounted because a lot of that work which spills on from the agricultural field to the domestic space is should be a part of the agricultural work like grading processing cow dung cake making etc but actually gets it doesn't really get counted as work however i want to problematize this a little bit it is not as clear as that so there are uh, there are issues which go against this larger idea of upstream having favorable gender space and downstream downstream having uh, regressive gender spaces so for example in bhutan even though the women had control over the agricultural land they were deciding what to do so far as machines were concerned it was only used by men which is something you can see in the heart of uh, hindi heartland for example also uh, this anjal already has spoken about when you look at uh, uh, you know a field this is in zero valley there is this double and triple burden so there are you can see only women there and however this does not mean that their housework or other things actually gets uh, any less so so really their work burden increases this is the flip side of them having in the uh, workspace uh then third is this arunachal where all of these four women i have taken their photograph is that all of them are more educated than their male counterparts or their husbands but all of them said that when we have a public meeting for the village say to, to decide about the river they have absolutely no voice so if they want to speak that's not look on looked on favorably so so they just don't speak this is a photograph from the apatani tribe where also men have tattoos and uh, similar kind of nose plaques and tattoos but the women uh, you know for the women it's far more entrenched it's a painful process of course we can see a second generation daughter here who does not have that so it's going but basically this is this marked as women as men's property now there is another kind of spatial relationship other than the upstream and the downstream so when you move closer to the river uh, compared to away from it and here embankments are very a useful kind of a marker for space so what we found was only the poorest of the poor irrespective of where you are along brahmaputra because flood is an annual event it is a problematic thing and an expensive thing both in terms of labor and uh, money uh, to to actually adjust adjust and adapt to flood even though they, they regularly do it so only the poorest of the poor have stayed back close to the river anybody who could could move out away from the river have moved away from the river 
So, so here there are two things. A community like, for example, the Mishing tribe who live on the river, let me say on the river, that is uh, uh, on, on one side of the embankment, where so, so they really are living with the river and their, their uh, livelihood is based on uh, fishing. Uh, and here, uh, so they have a very different view about the river compared to and the embankment compared to the people who had landed property who lived on the other side of the embankment, which is like, you know, uh, Assam's primarily uh, large landowners were also upper caste uh, landowners. So, um, so they looked on the river and the flood as a problem. Uh, the flood certainly as a problem, whereas the Mishing tribe looked on the flood, if it is not an extreme flood, as a actually way of living, because they said their fish productivity actually goes up when the flood it at a moderate level comes. So, um, so in the river also there are no property rights defined. Therefore, I had linked property rights with gender space. So you have a slightly, uh, uh, you know, more fluid kind of a gender space uh, of the people who live along the river compared to people who live away from the river. There it is very, very sharp. So, so there is a space and class divide uh, is what I'm talking about. Now, this um, I can actually skip. Uh, there are sharp gender roles, but actually when disasters happen, that dilutes gender division of work. So during the flood, you can see from this photograph, for example, the husband and the wife giving birth to the child, which is not usually uh, how the gender work, I mean, division of work would be. Uh, uh, fishing, uh, you know, when a, these are flooded times when I actually went there. So both men and women fishing, one in agricultural field, one uh, you know, alongside the road. Here, both uh, girl and boy children are together, uh, you know, uh, whatever they're doing, they, they, they suffer similarly. But as soon as, so before the flood comes, when they're preparing for the flood, there is an uneven burden for preparation of the flood on women. And post that, I can't say even or uneven, but it's just different. So men go out for looking for work and women are responsible for cleaning up the house, which is full of mud uh, and so on and so forth. A lot of infection and all of that. So it's very different kind of thing that happens. Now, this is where I'll stop because there's no time. I will, uh, there are two points of concern from this larger study that what we found was that when you are looking at the whole thing through a gender lens, there is a danger of pitching poor women against poor men. And I don't think that's, that distinction should be made. So, for example, as I said, people who are adjusting with flood all the time tend to be very poor. And both men and women are similarly, I mean, if qualitatively differently disadvantaged, but both are disadvantaged. Number two, what a generic thing which we found, irrespective of the upstream downstream difference in the gender scape, uh, there is a universal lack of agency to speak out about anything that makes a difference to their life in public meetings where decisions are being made. Now, the last thing I want to talk about because, I mean, I actually, when I was waiting, I included the slide because I felt the transboundary management issues would be uh, kind of important to, uh, uh, you know, this meeting. So number one, uh, in, there are similarities in social equity and gender issues across the country. So women vis-a-vis uh, -vis men are similarly placed, as I was talking about the universe, universality. Now, this can create potential solidarities for transboundary river management issue, though I don't think it has been looked on at this. So for example, if different countries uh, in terms of the how women vis-a-vis -vis men interact with the river and they uh, kind of build, uh, you know, kind of collaborate on this, I think it is possible to, you know, build solidarity. Number two, flood management, as I was saying, I mean, embankments, I, I did not have time to actually mention that. So, missions feel that the embankments are a bad idea because, because of the embankment, the, a normal flood 
for them translates into an abnormal flood because the water is restricted there. Whereas people who are on the other side, who are cultivating the field, obviously look on the embankment as something good. So therefore, flood management cannot be looked on if we have to be inclusive about it cannot be looked on as a unitary and homogeneous issue. There are differences and we have to acknowledge this. Lastly, and this is not following from what I've presented, but from the broader work that we have done, so far as Brahmaputra was concerned and people were concerned, the moment you come from middle basin to the lower basin, preventing erosion on the banks and shifting of the river course is seen. So, so erosion on the banks and shifting of river course is seen as a far greater disaster. And there's a homogeneous view about it compared to the flood. We did not really pitch one against the other, but this is something which came back to us again and again. So this has to be, if we are talking about say river management of any kind, and particularly with respect to Brahmaputra, this is one thing that we need to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was definitely a very different perspective, but extremely important because socio-cultural and socio-economic factors and gender bias definitely has a far greater implication, not just in the economic growth, but also in the strategic security as well. Thank you so much for your perspective, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, we will go to another very interesting dimension. I would request uh, Dr. Ruby Maloney, ma'am. She was a former head and professor of the Department of History, Mumbai University. She has published extensively on modern India and medieval India. Her specialization is the Indian Ocean and Maritime Trade with special emphasis on the history of Gujarat. She has published several articles and books, including European Merchant Capital and the Indian Economy and Surat Port of Mughal Empire. She has been a member of the Management Council and the Senate of Mumbai University and has been given the Recognition of Excellence Award by the M Mumbai University. She is currently engaged in research projects including Indian ports and intra-Asian trade, 17th and 18th century. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Good evening. I think it's already evening and we've been uh, having a very, very uh, edifying afternoon and uh, a very long, uh, very um, very interesting session, one after the other. And thank you, uh, uh, Commodore Dr. Arnab Das, for inviting me for this um, workshop seminar. I think already um, a lot has been said on this subject. And I don't want to be repetitive in what I say, because there have been very, very uh, eminent speakers who have been dealing with different aspects of the subject of the seminar. So I am going to be just referring to some points which I think. Um, I hope will interest you. Uh, the topic I have been, uh, I wish to talk about is riverine history and lessons learned. So um, as, a, as a historian of the Indian Ocean, historian of trade, historian of the seas, of the waterways, I was thinking, what are the lessons learned? There are many lessons learned, but I would like to focus on uh, ecology, on uh, the use of water and the environment, which is very important today all over the world. And I'm going to focus on rivers, uh, the history of rivers, to some extent uh, about the Brahmaputra, uh, a river on which this seminar is focused on. Um, India has had has a number of rivers, much more than some other countries. And each river has a cultural and mythological history of its own. And history of rivers are basically mythology. And in a country like India, which is very religious in its uh, characteristics, the mythology is also um, connected with religion and religious practices. Um, they have a, they have a, while rivers have a cultural history of their own, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural history of rivers. And uh, this cultural history has been contested at, in several uh, occasions, in several uh, periods of history. And um, most of these rivers, because of their uh, cultural history, have been revered and worshipped. In India, rivers are um, objects of worship. They are institutions. Um, there are Himalayan rivers, which is the Indus, the Ganges, the Yamuna, the, and the Brahmaputra. 
and there are peninsular rivers in the Indian subcontinent, that is the Mahanadi, the Godavari, the Krishna, and the Kaveri. And the entire subcontinent is crisscrossed by a number of tributaries and sub-tributaries, which form the known modus of transport, very importantly, right through historical times from ancient India to medieval India to modern India and to contemporary times, rivers are used by humanity, by civilization, as contact points, as connection points for vessels. Um, it will be interesting to know that most of the rivers which are revered and have a mythology and a history connected to them, it is the Brahmaputra River, which is the only male river, while the other rivers are female uh, rivers. We just had a talk by uh, Professor Sen where she talks about gender issues. So um, maybe historians would also be interested in knowing what made the Brahmaputra a male river and what makes the other rivers, most of the other rivers, into female rivers. But I'm not going to go into that history or that mythology because that's not what I want to talk about. Uh, to the Brahmaputra is, is revered by all, almost all religions, especially not only Hindus, but by Buddhists and Jains. And each uh, religious um, uh, paradigm has got its own mythology to give and to internet along with the Brahmaputra. Both in the past and in the present, the objective has been to maintain water resources and domestic security. Now I'm coming to this point about what are the objectives of the state? Whatever is the state, a kingdom or today's government or earlier governments, it has been to maintain the water resources to the best it can be done, domestic, geographical, and political security. And these are where the lessons are learned. Since my, since my subject talks about, since my subject is uh, emphasizing, uh, focusing on lessons learned. So um, these are the lessons to be learned, which are connected with issues of navigation and irrigation in the past also. Issues of navigation and irrigation. And other speakers have been talking about erosion of the river banks and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to keep on repeating uh, things which have already been said. Uh, and while different governments, different groups, both civil society and the state, have been concerned about navigation and irrigation in the past and in the present, each river system with its tributaries has its own ecological concerns. And it is these ecological concerns which need to be focused on. And these concerns are getting more urgent with the passage of time. I'm now going to talk about geopolitical political aspects from which lessons have been learned, which can be traced back to historical times. All rivers have been a field of battle and power play. And even today, the Brahmaputra River is a field of, of not battle, certainly not as yet, hopefully not, but of power play and geopolitical uh, contests. Um, the Brahmaputra, uh, a little bit of history now, pure history. In the 17th century, the Battle of uh, Sarai Ghat was held uh, specifically in 1671, which all of you must be knowing about, which was a naval battle between the Mughals and the Ahom Kingdom on the Brahmaputra River. And it was a contest for political power. This uh, contest, the Battle of Sarai Ghat, took place near Gohati. And it was a Ahom victory due to the brilliant use of terrain and the weakness of the Mughal navy. Uh, so we know that the Mughal empire was very, very strong. It was a land-based continental power. It did not focus on its navy. And that was the reason that in this battle of Sarai Ghat, the Mughal army, the Mughal navy had to succumb to the uh, power of the Ahoms. And uh, soon there was, in 1682, there was a battle of Itakhuli, where the Ahoms were able to push back the Mughal control to the west of the Manas River. So we can see how the river Brahmaputra has been the arena, the field of uh, political contestation, of battles. And I'm going to discuss, uh, as, the, as the audience knows, as the very, very senior prof professors, I'm sure, 
have discussed already that uh, Brahmaputra River is also a river where there are different um, states which claim to it. Um, it is a trans-border river. Brahmaputra is important, is significant, is special because it's a trans-border river passing through China, Bangladesh and India. So I'm trying to connect it and bring to your notice how the river Brahmaputra has been uh, uh, played a very, very important role in political contestations and geopolitical strategies. Now, water pollution is one of the biggest issues facing the world, challenging the world. And there are numerous seminars, numerous institutions, numerous think tanks globally, which are dealing with the issue of uh, water and water pollution and the gradual scarcity of water. This is perhaps an issue, an urgent concern, which is not yet come to the notice of all scholars and all uh, relevant uh, stakeholders. And here I'm going to say, that water pollution in India is one of the most urgent crises facing India at present. And this can be traced back to history. There's a lesson to be learned from history, at least in modern India. I think uh, riverine history was not really recorded in ancient times or medieval times, except for its mythological connections. So water pollution is now such a roaring issue that it has to be addressed. Untreated sewage is the biggest source of such form of river pollution in India. There are other sources of pollution, such as runoff from the agricultural sector, as well as unregulated units that belong to the small scale industry. So both agriculture and industry, large scale or small scale, I'm going to come to large scale uh, public sector units also, but we can see but whether for the Brahmaputra River or for other riverine uh, systems, this, this is a very big problem, both emanating from agricultural practices in India as well as uh, industries. The situation today is so serious that perhaps there is no water body in India that is unpolluted uh, at all. In uh, two, 2018, the Central Pollution Control Board, the CPCB, identified 351 polluted river stretches in India and Maharashtra, where we are, uh, both uh, Arnav Das and myself, he's in Pune, I'm in Mumbai. Maharashtra has the highest number of polluted rivers at a figure of 53. And while living in Bombay, I live in Bombay, in Mumbai, the Mithi River is now raising a lot of concern due to urban, uh, urban growth and urban usages of sewage, uh, uh, you, of sewage problems. So this is something which is very, very important. And about water bodies in India, more than 80% are highly polluted. And uh, especially this is applicable to human habitation in their immediate vicinity. So while the Yamuna and the Ganges River are the most uh, you know uh, in focus for this problem the brahmaputra river also perhaps is now facing urbanization and more population which are concentrated along the river and therefore it is also reaching that hallmark ranga and the yamuna are the most polluted rivers in india which is a pity we, we have seen all the pictures we know we've read all the articles uh, there are bathing during festivals there is uh, we saw during COVID how the river Ganges became uh, absolutely notorious, both in the international media and local media, due to the uh, cremation rites which were performed along its banks. So um, I fear that uh, religion uh, plays a very big role. Current religious practices and superstition plays a very big role in the pollution of water bodies in India, be it the very, very... Uh, now famous, rather, should I say, notorious Yamuna and the Ganges and Brahmaputra too and other rivers. Um, toxicity in water. This is a subject for scientists and technologists to discuss, but um, this, can be, this can be seen in detail. We are not going to go into the details for paucity of time, but I'm going to uh, talk about the Ganges River uh, in a short manner. 
it is the most sacred river one of the most important rivers in the world and for indians it is the most sacred river and therefore i'm using the word therefore the most polluted the causes are include the disposal of human sewage and also disposal of animal waste then increasing population density at a galloping pace and the disposal of industrial waste into the rivers and this has been going on again i go back to history as a historian i think i must mention history uh, intermittently if you look at the pace of industrialization in uh, in india in different towns and cities kanpur banaras and other places we find that uh, you know the disposal of industrial waste into the river becomes a very big problem and this is true of ganga very much cities and towns large and small located on the banks of the river ganges generate around 33% of waste water that is generated in total in the country which is a huge figure which is a huge statistic 33% of the waste water which is generated in the entire country this should be noted and though the government of india the present government is working very hard with number of projects such as namo gange which has been widely uh, talked about yet we would like to uh, you know uh, study further its efficacy its success and its continuous efforts then let's look at the yamuna river yamuna river is now proved to be the one of the most unsustainable for any aquatic life and i think this will interest some of the participants in this uh, seminar because we are talking about uh, uh, dr arnab das has been talking about pollution in rivers and uh, what's happening in the in the brahmaputra river and we find that does the yamuna river have any pretensions of sustaining any aquatic life it, it can be called a dead river because it does not have enough oxygen to support any river life its self cleansing inducing free flow is also hindered by urban development what is this we are talking about we are talking about self cleanse inducing free flow and here i am again connecting it with the brahmaputra river which is very uh, very um, you know lucky in having this kind of a free flow but this free flow of the yamuna is now which is known to everybody all of us is completely hindered by urban developments so this is again a lesson which i'm putting forward for the river brahmaputra and the people who are who are studying it who live there to see what urban development can do to the free flow of a natural free flow of a river um what are the causes specific causes of the pollution of the waters of the yamuna untreated sewer water from unauthorized colonies and also interstate factors involving uttar pradesh and haryana so again while the brahmaputra river uh, has to deal uh, has flows through different nations the yamuna has different kind of problems but again contestations between different states of india so these are certain problems who takes the responsibility who is responsible for a clean river who is responsible for the clean water do the states have to work together does haryana uh, do haryana and um, uh, uttar pradesh work together or do they do they have contests with each other and the same applies as far as the brahmaputra river is concerned between china bangladesh and india and i'm not going into contemporary politics and other issues which i'm sure is known to the others um we've been seeing a lot of uh, lot of illustrations lot of media coverage of the yamuna pollution uh, lately with the chhat puja where we see that um, you know the the river was absolutely full of foam a white foam it it looked like a bubble bath or worse and this is due to the extreme level of toxicity in the river and all that the government of that particular uh, delhi government could do was just spray water hoses of water on it and it seemed very uh, elementary and it seemed uh, rather um, unfortunate religious offerings are uh, dumped in the river regularly apart from chhat puja or other festivals and this goes on constantly it applies to the ganges river it applies to the yamuna river which makes them absolutely polluted um according to the united nations habitat estimate the city of delhi dumps 3 billion liters of waste 
into the Yamuna each day. Per day, the city of Delhi dumps 3 billion lit liters of waste into the Yamuna. So can it be even imagined that this is happening? And there are sewage treatment plants. Those who live in Delhi, they know this. Uh, at Okla and other places, these are these STPs. They are not able to deal with this problem at all. They exist and the technology is quite modern. So how are we learning any lessons from history? If we go back to history, everybody has got the Taj Mahal in mind when it comes to the Yamuna. If you see photographs, the Yamuna River is a trickle. It's just a bare trickle where before in the days of the Mughals, Jahangir and Shah Jahan and others, Shah Jahan particularly, would be sitting along uh, the Taj Mahal's uh, ramparts and enjoying the cool breeze and listening to musicians with the beautiful river Yamuna flowing calmly and serenely and cleanly next to the Taj Mahal. And now the Taj Mahal is in fact completely uh, the white, the famous white marble uh, is now, uh, I'm stating again something which is known to everybody, that it's completely turned yellow and big efforts are made to give it face packs and other packs to make it fairer, to make it white. But it's a, it's a no-win struggle because there are so many effluences coming from so many, um, you know, informal, formal, legal, illegal, industrial plants along the river. So lessons of history, contemporary history, are just not being learned by, uh, by modern society. Another river I'm going to mention is the Damodar River, which flows through the states of Jharkhand and West Bengal. And this is also in the list, in the doubtful eminence of a very, very polluted river in the country. What is the cause of this? Specifically, multiple coal industries on the mineral loaded banks of the river. So, Jharkhand and West Bengal, minerals, where there are minerals, again, rivers are the victims of the, of the treasure of the Mother Earth. So, can we see the connection of nature? how nature gives us minerals, but we are not able to, um, you know, handle it. And then we have rivers who are the victims of this. Um, for, for instance, in 1990s, an estimated 2 lakh liters of furnace oil began to be spilt into the river Damodar. So here is another instance of industry and how rivers are the victims of industry and mining and so on. Another river I would like to talk about is the Bagmati River, which flows through Kathmandu in Nepal and joins the Kosi River in Bihar. It is considered, again, very holy. It has a lot of mythology connected to it, both um, related to Hinduism and Buddhism. But today, the river Bagmati is nothing but a foul-smelling, heavily uh, polluted river uh, it, it is like an industrialized um, drain-like stream. It, is, it can't even be called a river. It can only be called a stream, which is marked to be unsafe for both drinking as well as irrigation. In fact, the Kosi River in Bihar, and I have lived in Bihar for a long time, and I've known people who've been working in the Kosi project in the mid-20th century. It is called the River of Sorrow. Some other uh, participants spoke about flooding. There are also problems of flooding. And Kosi River is very uh, notorious for its flooding problems. And it is therefore called the River of Sorrow. Um, if we look at history in general, we can list out the causes of river pollution in India. And river pollution is what my talk is focusing on. The single biggest reason or factor for water pollution in India is urbanization at a, at a galloping rate, at an uncontrolled rate. Any of the governments, whether state governments or central governments of different political views, are not able to either give sufficient focus to it or to solve it. Modern Indian history, if we look at and we study it, we see this is the problem. And, uh, all the, all the activities of industry particularly have left an indelible mark on India's aquatic resources. We are blessed, as I said earlier, we are blessed by mineral resources. India is blessed with aquatic resources, but we are not able to take care of them. Um, since uh, this inability to focus on the problem or deal with the problem, 
has led to several environmental issues in the long term, like paucity in water supply and generation and collection of wastewater, which are very, very important. It is estimated that cities with populations of more than 1 lakh people generate around 15,600 million liters of wastewater in a day. Strangely enough, strangely enough, 70% of the people who live in these cities and uh, due to whom there is a lot of wastewater have access to sewage facilities but it is due to improper practices in the agricultural sector number second industrial waste and third inadequate industrial treatment of waste oil leaks from ships acid rain and global warming these are some of the factors in general which we have seen uh, increasing over a period of time in history I think uh, Commodore Das and others have talked about this and know about this and have discussed this here and before. The reduction in water quantity in rivers. This is a very important factor which can be again traced back to history. Water in India's major rivers has plummeted drastically. Central Water Commission data tells us that by 2015, the Brahmaputra River, the water in it dropped by 95.56 billion cubic meters that is BCM, and in the Ganges, this uh, water level fell by 15.5 BCM. So can we see, are we comparing this, that um, the data tells us that the reduction in water quantity in Brahmaputra in 2015 dropped by 95.56 billion cubic meters, and in the Ganges, much less. Reports also show another disturbing trend that between 2014, 24 and 2014, that is 10 years, the catchment area of the Ganga was reduced by 2.7% and the Brahmaputra by 0.6%. So the river Brahmaputra is getting there. If the catchment area of the Ganga in 10 years, 22004 and 2014, the catchment area of the Ganga was reduced by 2.7%, the catchment area of the Brahmaputra was reduced by 0.6%. This is something which, again, can be studied further. I come to the Brahmaputra now specifically. The mighty Brahmaputra has the greatest volume of water of all the rivers in India, and it has a water surplus. It's at the moment less polluted than most other rivers in India, and its main problem used to be flooding, and it still is. But at present, the pollution can be related to the petroleum refining units which release industrial pollution into the waters of the Brahmaputra. And Brahmaputra as a lifeline of Assam is itself to, struggling to breathe in the toxic environment it flows in. Flowing with a stretch of 2,900 kilometers, the Brahmaputra suffers from heavy emissions of sewage waste, oil and chemicals from various polluting sources. Efforts to revive the lifeless torrents suffocate today in the midst of political blame games and diplom diplomatic negotiations. Um, the Oil India project and the search for black gold in the Brahmaputra has led to a very drastic destruction of flora and fauna on the Brahmaputra. Actually, at present, uh, again, as I'm sure the participants and the, uh, uh, the speakers have discussed and know that Oil India has been looking for further oil reserves in the middle of the uh, Brahmaputra. And this is a very, very challenging task since the Brahmaputra is one of the most turbulent rivers in the world. The, the oil reserves have to be drilled below the river bed. This is not possible when torrential rain and floods are there. The oil major has already identified at present recently a stretch about 60 kilometers on the Red River, extending towards the north of the world's largest freshwater island of Majuli, and the company is now beginning the search for black gold. Uh, I think I have run out of time. I, uh, I have 20 minutes allotted to me, so I'm going to conclude by saying that uh, my intention and my objective in speaking at this uh, very important seminar is to emphasize the mounting water challenges in India and in the world. Human interference is the factor that has changed every river's form and flow pattern 
over historical times. Political blame games and diplomatic negotiations go on in the past and in the present. But what, are, what is to be done to solve this very, very pressing problem today? Degradation of rivers, especially the Brahmaputra, which is now almost getting to that very critical stage, needs continuous and serious debate by civil society as well as by policy changes by the government of India. 2019, the Ministry of Jal Shakti was formed uh, and uh, efforts are being made by the government to, to work towards this. And I would like to end by saying that the health of people is inter intimately intertwined with the help of rivers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was definitely very important inputs for the policy makers. And uh, I'm, I hope uh, things will change and we are very much uh, in the uh, process of creating the awareness that you talked about. And uh, we'll continue with our effort and hope that there will be cha positive changes uh, going forward. Thank you so much, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, additional uh, Director General of Police uh, could not uh, continue because of an urgent meeting he had. I will now request uh, Professor Jayanta Bandapadhyay, sir, is a professor, uh, the researcher and author on science and the natural environment. He received his PhD degree in engineering from IIT Kanpur in 1975. He then joined the Center for International Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, USA, as a visiting postdoctoral fellow. He joined the faculty of IIM Bangalore in 1978 and started work to work on public interest knowledge. In 1979, he got deeply involved in understanding the reasons behind the forest rights movement in the Uttarakhand Himalaya, widely known as the Chipku Andolan. In 1988, he joined the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, Kathmandu, where he continued to work on environment and development in the Himalaya. He then joined the International Academy of Environment in Geneva as Director of Research. He has been a coordinating lead author for the global document Millennium Ecosystems Assessment. He has been advisor to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, IUC in De New Delhi, Water Diplomacy Program at Tuft University in USA. His research has promoted several important public interest lit litigations in India. Professor Pandapadhyaya has authored 14 critical acclaim a critically acclaimed book and monographs in addition to 140 research papers and popular articles. Sir, the floor is yours, please. I, I thank the organizers for taking up the issue of uh, Brahmaputra. Brahmaputra is the largest flowing river in India. And our knowledge of this river is exactly the opposite. And even after all these uh, uh, speakers spending more than two hours now, I don't think we have gone far ahead in understanding the, the issues of Brahmaputra. Uh, the last speaker spoke on Ganga, Yamuna, Bhagavati, uh, etc. But each river has its own ecological characteristics. And uh, understanding Brahmaputra is a task by itself. So all the time could have been spent on Brahmaputra. Now, I think uh, sensationalism has to be shown the door in understanding the challenges of Brahmaputra. And particularly with respect to climate change. Uh, very recently, the IPCC appointed me as the expert reviewer for the synthesis report of the three group reports of the AR6, as well as the special reports that followed. And I think climate change and uh, Brahmaputra needs a lot of in-depth understanding. And that is not the responsibility of IPCC or UNFCCC. It is the responsibility of us, Indians, Asians who, who share Brahmaputra. And I think uh, only in the, pre in the uh, presentation by Dr. Ghosh, 
we have some amount of uh, going deeper into the understanding of Brahmaputra. Because uh, I don't think uh, all the 10 rivers of uh, Hindu Kush Himalaya originates from one uh, single point called uh, Manasarovar or uh, Mount Kailash. The eastern, eastern Qinghai is the origin for Yellow River as well as the Yangtze. The southern Tibet, which is about 2000 kilometers away from Mount Kailash, is the origin of Mekong Salve Niravadi. Uh, it is only Brahmaputra or Yarlung Zangbo, the tributary to Brahmaputra, the Ganges, and the Indus originate from nearby areas of uh, Mount Kailash. We have the Amudarya, which is the Himalayan river also, originating from the Hindu Kush Himalaya and uh, Tarim originating further up north. So uh, we have to understand the origin of the rivers correctly first. Now, the rivers are not magic things creating water and flowing from one point to other. What is not understood well in the case of Brahmaputra, and in spite of all the studies on climate change, the climate process of Brahmaputra is not very clearly understood by, particularly by journalists who keep on writing on the Brahmaputra. It is going to dry up, it is going to have floods. Uh, the, the mechanism of Brahmaputra is such, the meteorological mechanism of Brahmaputra is such that it will have immense amount of precipitation in short periods at the root of the three rivers called uh, Lohit, uh, Dibang, and Dihang. Dihang is also called uh, downstream uh, uh, Siang and uh, passes through Pasighat, joins the other two, that is the Lohit, Dibang, and Dihang or Siang, uh, creates the Brahmaputra in the town of Hodia or Saudia, as the pronunciation may differ. And Brahmaputra starts from there. And the problem and challenges, problem in the sense of not understanding the ecology and challenges for those who understand the ecology starts from there itself because this is where the South Asian summer monsoon and the East Asian summer monsoon, they interact with each other and sometimes they create tremendous amount of uh, concentrated intense precipitation. So the meteorology of the upper Luhit, upper Dibang and upper Dihang is not well understood because we do not have much data. That is why the Dr. Ghosh has mentioned that we are talking of data in Tibet, whereas the flood is happening a few hundred kilometers downstream and in a very, very different meteorological condition. So I think that distinction has to be understood that we do not have much data on the Brahmaputra as and when floods are created. And when the floods are created, whether it is in uh, Lohit, Dibang or Dihang or even Subansiri, the flood is carried downstream. Now there was mention about the problem called shifting. Himalayan rivers, especially those rivers where there is intense rainfall at the upper catchment, <laughs> the issue of creation of sediment, rapid transportation of sediment, and rapid deposition of sediment is as old as several million years when the Himalaya has been growing. So it is nothing new and nothing uh, to, to say that this is a problem. This is part of nature. 
if you do not understand it you call it a problem if you understand it you try to address it properly and that is why there was a mention of understanding of river flow as not cubic feet of water per second passing through one single point but a totality of description of river flows as containing water containing energy biodiversity and sediments among many other things this is a limited description but one has to start somewhere integrating the concepts and that is why management of brahmaputra has to start from the sky management of brahmaputra has to start from integration of meteorology rainfall and hydrology without that understanding simple cwc measuring cubic feet of water passing through the, the uh, one station per day uh, or per hour or per minute is not going to have uh, any deep policy change how much ever we may have seminars how much ever we may have uh, concerns about policy i think the question is not of educating the commoner commoner has a very little role in such a thing the question is of educating our scientists engineers policy makers because they are having the access to data they are having the access to theory of hydrology they are having the access to design and engineering just saying inform the people what will they be informed they will be informed that one small hydropower dam in uh, china is going to make brahmaputra dry and then make a hula balu we have to understand the science we have to understand good peer reviewed publications and not very sensational journalistic writings uh, i think uh, the time is uh, passing i have also something else because my time was ending at 6 pm but uh, i think brahmaputra needs very very deep attention and uh, when i talk of navigation brahmaputra has a potential only when you understand the flow of brahmaputra in its waves diversity water energy biodiversity and uh, sediment otherwise we will keep on telling oh there is sediment in the river and there is a shifting of the river bed shifting of the river bed is several million years old there is nothing one can do about it as long as himalaya is standing as long as the monsoon is hitting the himalaya there will be sediment there will be sediment flow there will be sediment deposition so the ecology of the river has to be understood from the sky to the confluence with ganga where padma is created and this is something where deep scientific interdisciplinary uh, analysis is needed it cannot be solved in one seminar it cannot be wished away public uh, information will uh, be enough we are badly in need of good scientific literature we are badly in need of good scientists with interdisciplinary minds who will understand the river its challenges and not call it just a uh, sort of sorrow of uh, uh, assam because the, the britishers did not understand the hydrology of himalayan rivers and it was the sorrow of the britishers that they wrote in english geography books and we keep on saying it is the sorrow of such and such it is there is no problem with kosi for 50 years 50, 45 years the flood water is good flood water irrigates flood water provides you with new so soil for 2 years or 3 years in for 50 years you might have an extreme flood where there is a loss but for 45 to 46 years you have been gaining 
So over a period of 100 years, the Himalayan rivers are a source of major economic gain for humanity. That is why, in spite of the sorrow of uh, the region, people flock into that particular area. As someone was saying that there is more people going to live. If it is a sorrowful river basin, why should people go in large numbers and start living there? Why should tea gardens and uh, paddy fields uh, come up rapidly growing in uh, Brahmaputra uh, uh, sub-basin? So we have to be more scientifically astute. We have to really go into deep research. Unfortunately, because of the status of these rivers, Ganga, Brahmaputra as border rivers, research has been uh, very little and research publications have been even very much less. I think science cannot grow in a, a stifling situation. If you have to have science, if you have to save the river Brahmaputra, you must have open uh, understanding of the ecological processes that needs open data and uh, not a, uh, a data confidentiality which provides you with very little uh, option for open discussion and publication. Brahmaputra is a great challenge and I think there is enough people in our country to undertake this uh, great challenge and address if they are ecologically minded, their knowledge base is interdisciplinary, and they are systematic in their approach and not very much reductionist and uh, sensationalist. I think my uh, closing remark uh, closes here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was definitely extremely uh, frank and uh, very <coughs> insightful, I would say. and. Uh, just to complement what you said, sir, I mean, our attempt is also, uh, I mean, unless the pol policy makers are also sensitized, the desired attention to science uh, or desired attention to the data gathering and basically, I mean, the policy makers will determine what needs to be given more priority. I mean, there will be always a conflict of various competing uh, requirements uh, that the policy makers will have to uh, decide upon and uh, i think uh, the attempt has been to bring various voices of various uh, disciplines various uh, stakeholders uh, practitioners policy makers together in this forum and uh, in that sense uh, this was the fourth of the series where uh, we have uh, i mean uh, even uh, people uh, working on the federal structure interstate uh, issues and uh, strategic security as well we have tried to discuss and uh, bring out uh, a small report uh, which we share with the uh, decision making authority and we hope that uh, and as you rightly said sir the understanding on the brahmaputra is definitely very difficult a uh, different uh, or very very minimal and the most important thing is that's a very unique river. Anybody who understands any river anywhere else in the world cannot say that he can uh, manage this river in a manner that it has to be done. So thank you very much, sir, uh, for your very, very insightful comments. And we definitely take note of the points that you made. And we will try and take it forward to the decision makers as possible. Thank you very much, sir. So we come to an end of uh, today's uh, webinar. Unfortunately, uh, ADG uh, from Assam could not join because he had to leave for an urgent meeting. Uh, but we had a different spectrum from various uh, esteemed speakers today. And I thank all of you, uh, starting with uh, General Khandare, bringing the strategic security perspective from his background. And he is at the very senior decision making level. and we. But definitely, uh, he has attended most part of the webinar and uh, we will also be reaching out to him with the webinar report and seek his support in taking things forward. Then we had uh, Anjil uh, Prakash sir bringing a different con uh, perspective from the climate change uh, aspect. Uh, we had uh, uh, Suchitra Sen ma'am talking about the gender uh, as issues and various aspects related to that. 
we had maloni uh, ma'am talking about the historical perspective and the lessons to be learned uh, ghosh sir of course uh, has a deep understanding of the region uh, the river and the basin and he brought out uh, very very clearly the lack of data and the various ground realities which needs to be stitched together and definitely jayanta uh, pandavadi sir bringing out uh, the crux of the whole issue of how science uh, needs to be uh, taken forward and how much uh, resource allocation and how more focus needs to be brought in there thank you all so much uh, the participants also we had some very uh, eminent participants as well and i thank all of you for joining us in this uh, webinar thank you very much we'll end the webinar now thank you <laughs>